Hello and welcome back to Philosophy and Humor. This week we're going to take a look at uh, superiority theories of humor. This is uh, module four and this right here, today's material, is chapter four of course. It uh, starts on page 33 and goes to page 48. So not super long, but what I've done is I've expanded some of the material that is in the text to kind of give you a better, more comprehensive idea of what superiority theory actually consists of, because it is one that we talked uh, about last week. And we're going to take a quick look at uh, the main points from last week. We talked about Plato uh, looking at laughter as somehow uh, more in line with our base instincts rather than our reason, which is really what we should be doing. He thought that laughter would be a threat right to a person that is an idealist someone that really deals with ideas rather than behavior or social interaction maybe uh, but on the other hand he thought that it was possible to use humor and certainly laughter is a kind of corrective uh, to be used in a pedagogical way in other words an educational kind of way uh, but ultimately, uh, Plato was a, an early uh, example of the superiority theory in the sense that laughter upsets our serious nature. We're laughing at vice rather than virtue. We're laughing at malicious behavior and bad behavior. And uh, this is something that Plato just did not buy into. Now, Aristotle, uh, who was one of uh, Plato's students, uh, he agreed to a certain extent with Plato but thought that, you know what, okay, as well as immoral behavior uh, and maliciousness, that's true. That is uh, often the source of humor. And we do feel superiority towards the person we're laughing at, not with. He also says too, that we can also enjoy things that are ludicrous, things that are bizarre or absurd or strange, but we look at them as being incongruous. And this is another theory that we're going to look at uh, next week. This week is superiority. Next week is incongruity. And once again, we have the two sort of masters of early forms of philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, in a sense, uh, creating the groundwork, right? The foundations for what will become ideas that are revisited many centuries later, essentially starting in the 1600s with uh, uh, René Descartes that we're going to look at shortly. So Aristotle does argue with, uh, does agree with Plato to a certain extent, but says that humor can be more than that. It can be laughter at the incongruous, the absurd. And then finally, we looked at Cicero, who talked about laughter again in a rather unique way uh, as an orator, right, a public speaker. He thought that humor could be derived from what thing, uh, things that people say or that they do. And humor can also be used as a kind of rhetorical device. We can be using really unusual metaphors to kind of drive home a point, uh, to keep people from getting bored, in a sense, when they're listening to our sort of early TED Talks uh, during the, the rise of the Roman Empire. But humor could be used to add levity and add some kind of, you know, wit and uh, sort of deflate pomposity and self-importance. And if we are doing this, we're at the very least keeping the audience's attention. And if we get them to laugh too, that's okay. Uh, but certainly when we are speaking, we should be allowed, speakers should be allowed to stray from the truth, stray from literal facts in order to uh, formulate a joke. So we shouldn't always have to tell the gospel truth, we'll call it. Uh, so we can stray from literal facts in order to create uh, a comedic environment or a comedic effect, right, in terms of these rhetorical devices. So the most important thing, too, that Cicero points out to us, uh, and something that is still used today, is the ability to laugh at something that is offensive, but presented to us in an inoffensive way. So depending on how light uh, the metaphor may be, we can sometimes discuss things that we recognize as being offensive or rude or naughty or cheeky or whatever, depending on your age. Uh, but it's something, it's a device by which we can talk about things that are maybe difficult, but we talk about them in an inoffensive manner. So it is a really remarkable tool. Humor is, a, is, a, is this magic or you know, this gift that we have that we express through language to talk about difficult uh, subjects, talk about hard truths, but we are also allowed periodically to stray from those literal facts in order to create that humorous effect. So that's essentially all of the ideas from last week.
So now let's uh, kind of jump into the deep end of superiority theory. And we'll start with uh, René Descartes. Uh, Descartes was a French philosopher, as you can see his birth and death dates, 1596 to 1650. So he lived during the 17th century. And he was a French philosopher and mathematician. And he's really kind of the first uh, major thinker to uh, reevaluate and revisit this relationship between laughter and superiority. And as a scientist, of course, he was very much interested in, of course, science. But he was also uh, interested in a range of other things. I'm just going to read sort of a short passage. Uh, this is from this book here, The Cambridge Companion to Descartes. There he is again. Uh, and this is from a, a chapter on Car Cartesian dualism. Now, don't worry about that. But what I want you to do is to think about what I'm going to read. Um, as a scientist, Descartes believed that the human body was, was a mechanical thing. It was a kind of mechanical entity. So the ideas he presents to us about laughter reflect this mechanical viewpoint that he had, or mechanistic viewpoint that he had of the human body. And uh, in one of his texts, he says, a list of functions to be explained in this way without any reference to the soul is highly ambitious. It comprises digestion of food, the beating of the heart and arteries, the nourishment and growth of limbs, respiration, waking and sleeping, the reception by external sense organs of light, sounds, smells, tastes, heat, and other such qualities, the imprinting of ideas of those, of those qualities in the organs of the common sense and imagination, the retention of stamping of these ideas in the memory, the internal movements of the appetites and the passions, and finally, the external movement of all of the limbs which aptly follow both the actions and objects presented to the senses, and also the passions and impressions found in the memory. Kind of sounds like a, a CD-ROM, doesn't it? read-only memory, uh, everything is mechanical, right? The digestion of food, the beating of hearts, uh, nourishment and growth of limbs. This is how Descartes essentially saw the, the human body. He thought that it really was this mechanical thing. And that was certainly not out of the ordinary because another really interesting book here, which I don't know if you can see the title very well, I'm going to put it right there. It is called The Lure of Antiquity and the Cult of the Machine. And the cult of the machine is exactly what was going on. This very famous picture here inside is a picture I'm going to show you here next, which is this one here, this 240 year old uh, automaton, the world's oldest robot. And I'm pointing this out to you because at that time, there was this fascination with uh, creating or at least realizing Descartes ideas of the body as this mechanism. Uh, and the artists and you know scientists and engineers went to work creating these very lifelike robots and it, as you can imagine it kind of freaked people out because these movements were very subtle the the notion this picture here of a little boy writing at a desk and imagine seeing this for the first time that this almost lifelike thing is responding like a human being and looking and acting like a human being but but isn't one so I'm not going to call it an early version of an AI robot, but it was certainly an automaton in the sense that the movements were done automatically. They were programmed through me uh, mechanical devices, but it was this idea of reproducing the body as a kind of mechanical being. So this is something that is kind of in the air. This is a, a, a worldview, a viewpoint of some scientists, but certainly Descartes in particular. And when we look at his account of laughter, we can see that it is, in a sense, mechanical. Right? His conception of the effects of, of laughter seem to be me uh, mechanical. And this notion of a buildup of steam or pressure, this we revisit in a couple of weeks when we talk about relief theories of humor. But it begins even here. The connection is already being made. This notion of a building up of steam, right? A, you know, kind of a head of, of steam of pressure and the aggressive nature of laughter. So if not, uh, if, if our nature is to release pressure through laughter, it is kind of like a steam whistle, right? Instead of the sound of a steam whistle, it's a sound of laughter. So there is an aggressive nature to laughter. It is a release of built up tension and steam and pressure. Um, the notion of a punchline being hostile, like punchline, just think of the word, it's a punchline. So these kinds of things are, are really sort of worth considering in terms of where these ideas came from. And they come from Descartes. They come from his idea of the body functioning like a mechanical being. 
So uh, speaking of mechanical beings uh, and the aggressive nature of laughter, uh, what I'd like you to do here is, is have a look. And I apologize last week, I forgot to put the links at the bottom of the YouTube page. I left them on the module three page on FOL. This week, I will remember to post them, I promise. But this first clip here is uh, the appearance of Tom Waits, an American singer who's, who's still around. Uh, but this was a clip from about, I think, I was watching it as a teenager, so it would have been 1976, roughly, on a television program called Fernwood Tonight. And it was a, it was a parody, or it was a spoof, of uh, basically talk shows, daytime talk shows, of which there were many, many during the 1970s. In the same ways we have a lot of late night talk shows these days in in the 21st century there were tons of daytime talk shows uh across all the american channels during the 1970s and this is kind of taken the uh, it's, it's taken the mickey out of it as they say in britain uh it's making fun of them but what i want you to do is to pay attention to barth gimble right uh the character played by martin mull who was there's the main character uh the host of fernwood tonight and now he's very glib and condescending towards tom waits doesn't quite understand what he's singing about, although he, Tom Waits is singing is quite strange, but stick with it because it, it's quite funny. And it contains one of the one of my favorite lines that I've ever heard of that show. And if you've ever heard it mentioned by someone else, they didn't write it. It came from this television program. I won't say what it is, but you'll, you'll know it. Anyway, so Tom Waits on Fernwood Tonight, uh, being interviewed by Barth uh, Gimbel, played by Martin Mull. And Fred Willard is his sidekick is there and notice the interaction of this this aggressive nature of laughter uh, Barth Gimble making fun of his sidekick his sidekick not even in on the joke and then the tables are turned and Tom Waits starts doing it to Barth Gimble and starts basically sort of browbeating him and a boring money from him so it's a, it's a fun little clip have a look at it and when you're done come on back to the next panel so we're talking about superiority theories here with Descartes and the idea of laughter is an interaction between the mind and the body. And the passage I, I read from you or for you uh, sort of highlights this kind of mechanical view of the movement of limbs, the beating of the heart, the inhaling and exhaling of the lungs. And of course, Descartes in trying to understand what laughter is applies, of course, the very same template. And he says in Article 125, the surprise of admiration and wonder, which while being mighted by joy, may open the orifices of the heart so quickly that it inflates the lungs. And so laughter is the inflating of the lungs uh, with this kind of pressure, this and then, then this release through the mouth in the form of of an audible sound of ha 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 or the wheezing or whatever. Or if you remember a couple of weeks ago, the clip of all the different types of laughter, whether it's a wheezer, the silence or whatever, doesn't matter. But the escape or the release of the pressure built up by this sense of admiration and wonder or the hearing of a good joke is in fact that. The, the laughter that is expelled from the body in this kind of mechanical sort of way uh, also, too, Descartes believes that when this is happening, uh, the body loses temporarily a sense of self-control. Uh, and so there we're looking backwards to Plato. Plato who said essentially the same thing, right? It, it, it appeals to our baser instincts. Um, it's not reasonable. We're laughing at vice rather than virtue. And so we're, we lose our sense, our sense of self-control, something that would have mortified Plato. So we want to make sure that we're not doing that. It's not a good thing to lose control. So Descartes views humor and specifically laughter, because at this point now, we're, although it fits into superiority theories of humor, these are still ideas about laughter, which is the physical or physiological manifestation of humor. And I mentioned, I think, in the first uh, first week we, we met, there was a distinction between humor and laughter in the same ways there is a distinction between comedy and humor. Comedy is the content of the joke. Humor is the uh, the approach and the relationship we have between the listener and this and the speaker or like the, the comedian and the, uh, the audience and both of our relationships to the content. So it has a lot to do with how we position ourselves relative to the comedian and to the content. But here we're still kind of formulating theories about humor. We're more focused on laughter because it is that expression of humor. So he says, wonder and joy is possible causes of laughter. He focuses mostly on laughter's relationship to scorn, 
derision and mockery. So here we are back in this platonic language, right? That we're laughing at people's inferiorities, uh, you know, their, their downfalls, their, their inabilities to do things. So we're mocking them, right? We're making fun of them and we're deriding them and we're filling ourselves with scorn because we think that these people are just, just you know, bordering on subhuman. Like, how can they be just so stupid? Like they should know better. There's that superiority theory. And that's why these ideas, these ideas actually fit in. So for Descartes, these various uh, positions, these relationships represent joy mixed with hatred. Um, and again, you know, here we have Aristotle saying that like, the laughter mixed in with this sort of, not a sense of bitterness, but an, an acknowledgement of pain that, you know, what's just happened may be funny, but it's also painful. It's smacked in the face with a rake hand, you know, a rake handle. That's not fun. It looks funny, but it hurts. And so for Descartes, he is saying the same thing. When we are mocking someone or deriding someone, it is a kind of joy mixed with hatred. And he says, you know, the, this is, this is not a good thing. This is not, our, it's not us in our finest hours, right? This is not us, you know, in our, in our best versions of ourselves. So we need to be very careful when we do this because we need to make sure that the target of the humor is in fact, uh, valid. So ridicule and satire, if they're going to be used, much like Plato had said last week, it should have a positive social function. So satire and ridicule should be used in a pedagogical kind of way, an educational, positive social function. And still, it can be used in, in what's called modest ba bantering. This is uh, Descartes' term. Um, and we can talk about things and we can al allow people at least to become aware that they are acting in a somewhat inferior uh, manner because of inherent Oh, I don't know, racism, sexism, homophobia, stupidity, any of these things that we think can be changed and fixed and corrected. So we can laugh at people who we think are inferior, but we'd like to do it in a way that it's constructive, right? That is pedagogical, pedagogical, sorry, or educational. So mocking laughter is socially responsible when it acts as a corrective, right, to bad behavior. Uh, this is the clip that's now sort of a couple, a few years old, but after the Black Lives Matter protests over the summertime, it sort of takes on a different tone because certainly uh, kneeling, you know, at a, at a football game was not enough. And apparently you can, uh, depending on the color of your skin, you can take over the White House and kill people and that's okay, but how dare you take a knee? And so this is a clip from The Daily Show from, I believe, around 2017. Um, and so think of the idea of mocking laughter as being socially responsible when it acts as a corrective to errant behavior, to bad behavior. So have a look at this clip. I think it's still very, very relevant uh, and does point out this idea of mocking laughter. We're laughing at these people, but we know that there's something they could easily change. It's not a lifetime affliction. It's just ignorance, absolute ignorance on their part. So check it out and come back in just a moment. So the next person we're going to look at is Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes is living, as you can see, roughly at the same time as Descartes, uh, on the cusp of the uh, fifth, sorry, the 16th to the 17th century, born 1588, died in 1679. Now, don't worry about these dates. They are not going to appear in a test. I'm not going to ask you, you know, when was Thomas Hobbes born? It's irrelevant. What I'm trying to point out to you is the particular historical era in which they're living. Now, Hobbes, uh, living uh, at the same time as Descartes, also somewhat of a scientist, uh, also kind of a, a political state, a statesman, uh, philosopher as well. Now, he is clearer and closer to what we now call uh, superiority theory. He does point out something that is very important that we can use as a kind of, uh, a kind of definition. So his theory needs to be considered in relation to the view that human beings find themselves in this struggle for power that ends only in death. Now, sounds pretty bleak, but in this book here, I don't know if you can see it, this is Leviathan. This is one of many different covers. The very famous book, Leviathan, that he writes uh, in, a, in the book, he talks about social contract theory. And social contract theory is a solution to living in a state of nature, which is basically uh, everyone out for themselves. Right? There's no sense of law, there's no decorum, there's no morality, there's nothing. It's basically uh, a war of all against all. 
So that ceaseless struggle for power is a view that Hobbes has of people. It's he is very much a cynic, yes, uh, very much somebody that is rather pessimistic about the worldview that he, he's presenting to us, because he saw that people were capable of killing one another. He survived the English Civil War. So a civil war, that's when a country splits in half, right, and fights, they fight each other. So the notion of fighting and to the death was a very real thing for Thomas Hobbes. So what I want to do, though, is I want to sort of um, look at his specific ideas about laughter, because, yes, it is somewhat pessimistic overall, but it, it is, you can say it has a happy ending <laughs> because Leviathan talks about so social contract theory as a positive thing. But in that book and in others, like The Elements of Law, for example, written in 1650, he talks about laughter right, as a passion which hath no name. He, say, he writes, I may therefore conclude that the passion of laughter is nothing else but a sudden glory arising from a sudden conception of some eminency in ourselves, and by comparison with the infirmities of others, or with our own formally. And he also says in Leviathan, and I'll read essentially the same sort of thing, uh, this is a, a, a section in one of the uh, chapters where he talks about a whole range of different emotions, fear, despair, courage, anger, confidence, indignation, ambition, and so on. But then he gets to uh, laughter, and he says in section 42, Sudden glory is the passion which maketh those grimaces called laughter, and is caused either by some sudden act of their own that pleases them, or by the apprehension of some deformed thing in another. By comparison, whereof they suddenly applaud themselves, and it is incident most of them that they are conscious of the fewest abilities in themselves who are forced to keep themselves in their own favor by observing the imperfections of other men. So those key words here, um, a sudden act that pleases oneself, the apprehension, of, the apprehension of some deformity or deformed thing in another. Uh, we're conscious of these individuals having fewer abilities than ourselves. And we look at these imperfections and it causes us laughter and therefore much laughter at the defects of others. That's the key line. It's laughter at the defects of others. For of great minds, one of the proper works is to help and free others from scorn and compare themselves only with the most able. So again, there's a passage that clearly echoes and reflects this platonic view of humor as part of the superiority that we feel over others. We're laughing at, now, when he says deformities and defects, of the human character, not, uh, you know, not an actual physical handicap, but a deformity of character. That is what is clear for Plato, I believe, but certainly clear with, with Hobbes, because he says, no, we should be moving in the opposite direction. As he says, uh, when we're going to laugh, he says, you know, uh, compare ourselves only with the most able. We need to look to people that are good. And if we can do that, we end up being better individuals. So in terms of a clear definition of superiority theory, I can't think of a better one, right? We're laughing at other people's deformities of character. So individuals laugh at other people's inferiority or absurdities. They laugh at uh, some, some kind of suddenly revealed shortcoming. And it can be in ourselves too. Um, when you do something and you're, you're struggling with it and your friend is kind of looking at, at you with a kind of smirk in your face, on their face, I should say, and you're struggling with, oh, I don't know, trying to open a sugar container or something. And they look at you like, you know, you just have to take the lid off like that, you know, <laughs> and like, oh, right, right. Uh, yeah, I meant to do that. You laugh. Typically you should because it's just funny. So you see a shortcoming in yourself you know, not knowing how to open something, for example. Uh, it's it's a minor thing, but that sudden glory of like, oh, I finally figured it out. If you can laugh at it, that's a healthy thing because you're not going to, you know, now feel hostility towards your friend because they were laughing at you. You couldn't open up a sugar bowl or something. But what's happening here is that sense of suddenness, right? That's what di distinguishes uh, that sudden eruption, right? Now we're kind of talking about Descartes here, this sudden eruption of laughter. So that is different than what he calls a general feeling of superiority. The fact that we think all the time that we are superior to people. So speaking of superiority of people, schadenfreude, which we're going to find out what that means. Um, what I want you to think about is what Hobbes has just mentioned to us, that individuals laugh at other people's inferiority or deformities of character, absurdities. 
Uh, we also laugh at that suddenly revealed shortcoming uh, of our, our own self, our, our belief that we are superior when in fact we are not. So have a look at this clip, uh, which again was very politically um, relevant about two years ago, and it, it still is to a certain extent because we're not out of the thickets of the, the, the Trump you know, hell that we've been through in the last four years. It's not over yet. But have a look at this clip on schadenfreude, which is uh, basically sort of, you know, that sudden glory, that feeling that we've just been talking about. And then uh, we'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so we're talking about uh, schadenfreude, uh, pleasure derived from other people's misfortunes, which is essentially what superiority theory is, uh, that we've looked at in, in Plato, Descartes, now with Hobbes. And again, this this vocabulary, this language should start to sound pretty familiar, right? Laughter is a malicious or antagonistic enjoyment of our own sense of triumph over others, over their stupidity. So Hobbes, again, and I want to stress this, Plato and Descartes and Hobbes and uh, uh, Bergson that we're going to talk about shortly aren't in favor of this. This is not something that they think is a good thing. They think it's a very inferior thing. It's us at our worst. So there's not a there's not sort of an embracing of superiority theory. It's a pointing out that there should be objections to laughter on on these moral grounds because we are laughing at other people's expense, and if we're doing that, there is a kind of maliciousness to it because essentially the source of the laughter is other people's deformity of character, right? Other people's stupidity. So laughter that is provoked by absurdity and infirmity. Um, if it is something that is far more universal, uh, it's less likely to be, well, to be harmful to a specific group of people or to a specific person. If we can laugh at things that are perhaps more universal uh, or that are more inclusive, that regardless of one's, uh, you know, one's sex or race or re religious affiliation, we all live on the same planet. We are all essentially the same types of beings. So if the laughter is provoked by things that are universal, and we can still point out the absurdity and infirmity of these things, we're more likely to, to offend a lot fewer people. So here we're still kind of, you know, we're still in that field of Plato and Aristotle and Cicero. Remember Cicero telling us, um, we should try not to offend people, right, at the very least. And that is kind of an important thing to do. Uh, it's the fact that this is this idea is presented to us so early, which is quite remarkable. So if we can laugh at things that we universally share, we're less likely to be nasty. We could even be mildly instructive too. That's something else that's entirely possible. So we can make that step to the possibility of laughing at the idea of absurdity itself or people who simply act in an absurd way. And when we start doing that, we're now gonna be moving into the next uh, phase of this course, which is to talk about incongruity. So. We're here talking about sort of initially platonic ideas about superiority. We're shifting slightly now towards that Aristotelian language of, you know, the incongruous, which is something that is universal, that is inclusive, that all of us share in, all of us suffer from, or uh, all of us, you know, are likely to do. Uh, that type of humor seems to just be less, uh, less harsh, you know, less harmful to other people. So in social situations, which is something we find ourselves in all the time, uh, we don't always have to be laughing at a comparison between ourselves and someone else, the way that Hobbes talks about. Um, if we can abstract that behavior, right, that deformity of character from the person and just laugh at the behavior, that's, again, less nasty, less malicious, um, you know, less scornful. So ultimately, we're laughing at the absurdity. Right? We're laughing at absurdity, absurdity for its own sake. So if we are doing that, we're shifting slightly away from this notion of superiority because if we're laughing at something that is universal, none of us are superior. The, the speaker and the listener or even the subject of the joke are all in it together. So we're not really after feelings of superiority as we are going after feelings of incongruity. So hopefully you can see how that, that shift is now already starting to occur. Now, uh, there's a couple of clips here. Uh, Ricky Gervais' is first one in comedy. Uh, in here, we're talking about the object of laughter is not always someone that we're comparing ourselves to. We laugh at something that is 
sort of, as Hobbes would call it, abstracted from persons. In this first clip, uh, Gervais talks about how he constructs a joke. Um, and he is also very careful to explain to us how he writes comedy. So think about what we've just discussed, uh, the notion of superiority theory, uh, the notion of the absurdity of certain forms of human behavior, those kinds of behaviors that can be made fun of. Uh, so this is the first one. Now, the second one I just found uh, about a week ago, I saw it actually posted on Facebook. I forget what the feed was, but it was I clicked on video and there it was. And this one is even better because uh, Gervais, um, regardless of what you think of him as a comedian, I happen to think he's quite good. Uh, he certainly is willing to take, take chances. But I want you to watch this one clip. Now, when you go to YouTube to have a look at it, the clip runs almost an hour. But if you just scroll down just below, it has a breakdown of that one hour long interview. And I want you to click from where it says 1602. And it says, I think, offensive jokes is what it's called. So I'd like you to watch from 1602 to roughly 2602. I know it's about 10 minutes, but it's a very quick 10 minutes. And Ricky Gervais discusses three main ideas. So the first thing he talks about is, as he says, quote, hurting someone's feelings who doesn't deserve it. And here he starts talking about superiority theory, doesn't call it by name, but you'll you'll recognize the vocabulary very quickly. Uh, essentially, uh, the interviewer asks him, you know, have you ever had to take out a joke? Because his wife goes through his work and he says, well, no, no, but, you know, we have to work on it. So that first section, the second one where he talks about fair targets, and it's there that we can talk about what is coming up here in the second half of our slides where he talks about people who are fair targets, the type of behavior that they do uh, or a display and exhibit, that becomes fair targets. And in the third one, I would like you to think about Cicero's ideas of, you know, an interesting turn of phrase or even Aristotle who said the same thing, but certainly Cicero talking about these interesting metaphors for comedic effect. And he, Gervais, is responding to what an interviewer had done on uh, Twitter, I believe, or maybe Facebook, had posted a comment that he thought was sort of funny. And Gervais kind of riffs on it for a couple of minutes and talks about these dark metaphors. So those three reasons, I know it's a 10 minute clip, but I think it's really beneficial to watch it because it brings home a lot of the ideas we've already been discussing, but in a very pointed kind of way, in a very topical kind of way. So enjoy those, and I'll see you back in just a moment. So the next person we're going to talk about is Henri Bergson, uh, or Henry Bergson. Uh, but uh, Bergson is living uh, a much later time. He also um, segues the 19th and the 20th century, born in 1859 in France and, and died in 1941, and is certainly an important 20th century philosopher. Uh, in, in general, because he wrote other books as well, but the one that is of concern to us is a book called Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic written in 1900. And here, Bergson presents this really interesting idea about uh, laughter as this mechanical response to something being funny. Now, not mechanical in a in a Cartesian kind of way, because we talked about René Descartes and his little automatons and mechanical robotic re responses there's a little bit of that but the word mechanical here is something that is more to do with the behavior of the individuals that we're laughing at than it is about us bergson says yes we respond in a mechanical kind of way it is a kind of a spontaneous reaction um, but that mechanical response has to do with humor and how it's created so it is really worth looking at uh, because his ideas sort of bring us even closer to uh, the spirit of that which we were talking about. And so Bergson's ideas belong in the sort of larger sort of purview of, of his uh, understanding of human nature. In the same way as Plato, uh, Plato talks about uh, uh, sorry laughter as being kind of a, you know, a base version of ourselves. Well, Plato as an idealist wished to talk about nothing but ideas and reason. So there, therein lies why he thinks it's so bad. Uh, with Bergson, we have another kind of worldview where he talks about something called an élan vital. And that translates into English as vital force. And that vital force 
is what constitutes us as human beings. So that vital spirit, uh, a vital force, it can be a creative force, an evolutionary force through, say, procreation, uh, a self-creating force. If you happen to be, uh, you know, politically minded, you know, we, we create institutions, including democracy, which is now under attack in certain parts of the world. Um, but that elan vital, that, that, that vital force is what makes us uniquely human beings. So, it is a it's a pretty cool idea because it's one that is presented uh, at the very beginning of the previous century, and that Elan Vital it goes a long way to explain our willingness to constantly reinvent ourselves, recreate ourselves, and the reason why that's important is because when we lose sight of that Elan Vital, that creative vital force, Bergson believes that if we lose sight of it, we are losing sight of our humanity. We're losing sight of that which makes us human beings, that distinguishes us from spiders, from sloths, from whales, from everything else. That's a uniquely human thing. And I say spider, for example, that, you know, a spider just doesn't make a spider web because it likes to, because it has to. That's, that's all it does. It just makes spider webs because it needs to catch food. It needs to live somewhere. So that's different than us looking around and realizing we have a problem and we sort of set about the task of fixing it and we use our creativity and our intuition and our ability to experiment that's an elan vital that's a that's the vital force so the comic for bergson is associated with those moments when we forget our humanity our humanness and so bergson says that when that happens we are laughing at the fact that we're reminding ourselves that that person has temporarily lost that ability to to be a human being. So we'll look at it in a bit more detail. Uh, but this is a very famous clip uh, from Charlie Chaplin's movie Modern Times, made in 1936. And what I want you to think about as you're watching this clip is Bergson's idea of forgetting our humanness, right? Laughter becomes a reminder that we need to rediscover it once again. So watch carefully. Charlie Chaplin changing from a factory worker whose job, I'm not sure what it is to do other than just to tighten up bolts. And he's just tightening bolts, tightening bolts, tightening bolts. And things start going slightly crazy. And because he is so much an automaton, he loses his humanity. And a couple times, he is certainly running around like a little imp. But at times, he also looks like a bit of a, of a satire, right? Think of the satire plays from, from last week, um, sort of very sort of forward and, and almost sexualized sort of aggressive beings. Watch the responses uh, that he has towards females that he sees in the film. It runs about three or four minutes. It's a lot of fun. But I want you to think about Bergson's idea of uh, losing our humanness because he loses it, first of all, by becoming a kind of uh, mechanical being and then secondly he turns into this kind of almost bestial sort of satire character uh, it's kind of cool it's aged really well uh, a lot of fun uh, just recently watched the entire movie and it is it is really good uh, but this particular clip uh, really brings home this notion of losing one's elan vital so have a look at it and we'll see you in just a moment so superiority theories and Bergson uh, let's continue with this and Bergson's are agree, uh, arguments that one laughter is an exclusively exclusively human trait, just like the elan vital is, and laughter is also a shared and communal thing. We like to laugh together. We like to go to a theater or to see a play and laugh together. There's something there's something that is really kind of nice about being in a room full of people uh, and and sharing that kind of laughter. Going to a you know a comedy club, for example, the same kind of thing is happening. Uh, because we're sharing the values that we have about behavior and our ideas about deformities of human character. And we we sometimes go there to have them confirmed. Because when we're hearing a comedian, a good one, that is pointing out some of these foibles, we'll call them as human foibles, we're laughing in a sharing kind of communal way. Because all of us agree on what the correct behavior should be. So if we lose that elan vital, which is a universal inclusive thing we all have it when we lose it we are out of step with those social norms we're out of step with who we should be and we should and we ought to be able to correct that now whether it's corrected through other people laughing at us and we clue in pretty quickly we stop doing it or that person continues to do it and they're going to learn about it later 
we're still sharing together what we all inclusively believe to be the right way to behave. So there has there there's something also very social about uh, the way in which laughter is viewed by Bergson. So he says to function socially, that's us, we need to be aware of our place in the world and our ability to adapt to the world. So we have to be able to sort of fit in socially, but we also have to be able to adapt when things change. And Bergson talks about these two forces that are at work in a healthy social individual, which is a degree of tension and a degree of elasticity. So what does he mean by this? What he means is uh, to be uh, ha or to have elasticity, uh, you have a degree of flexibility and adaptability. So this is something, for example, um, I don't know how many people have seen the movie Groundhog Day with uh, Bill Murray. It came out, I think, the late 80s or maybe early 90s, somewhere in there. Point is, in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray's character uh, seems to be reliving the same day over and over and over again. Now, if he were, uh, you know, a, a thought-provoked existentialist, he would be having a crisis. Oh my God, this is awful. Like, it's the same day over and over again. This is This is hell. But no, Bill Murray suddenly realizes that, okay, this is happening over and over again. The same thing keeps occurring. Well, what can I do about it? Uh, how can I be, you know, rem uh, lessen that stress, right, that tension, and kind of go with it? And of course, the whole pro uh, point of the movie is that he's, you know, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, and boy gets girl again. Same sort of premise. But here, Bill Murray's character takes a what is uh, otherwise a kind of weird situation and adapts to it and uses it to his advantage. So he goes from being slightly stressed, right, the tension, I'm going to ignore that, and instead goes in the opposite direction towards elasticity. So what we are looking at at first is the potential for comedy in people that stress out too much, right? They don't relax and are not aware of where they are in the world. Now, this next clip, is, it's a couple minutes long, and I want you to think about the line functioning uh, socially. We need to be aware of our place in the world and our ability to adapt to the world. Now, this is a drunk businessman on an uh, escalator, of course, trying to go down the wrong, the wrong way. And now watch not only this gentleman's behavior, but also watch people around him because people go, again, uh, think of that sliding scale that I talked about last week with Aristotle. Things start funny or if they deviate just a little bit, they're funny. But if they deviate too far, they can become the source of anxiety. Uh, so we're not talking about scorn and derision and mockery. People get concerned. So watch within such a short period of time, uh, the drunken businessman at first is kind of funny. But people now realize what's going on and their their tone kind of changes. So it's like two minutes long, but uh, kind of an interesting uh, example of, of Bergson's élan vital and an unawareness of this, per, the, per, the, uh, the unawareness of being in one's world and an inability to adapt to that world. So kind of fun, but uh, socially kind of really interesting as well. So I'll see you back in a minute. Okay, so... We are laughing when we see examples of other people's inabilities to adapt to social circumstances, such as we saw with a drunken uh, businessman trying to go down the escalator. Uh, and we're laughing at them because we can identify what they're doing wrong. And yes, we do have a temporary degree of superiority, that, that sudden glory, right, that Hobbes is talking about. And so when, is, when we're laughing, according to Bergson, we're reminding ourselves of our humanity. We're reminding ourselves that there is a way to behave correctly. First of all, uh, the gentleman, drunk or not, is going down the wrong way on the escalator. First mistake. Secondly, if he's as hammered as he is and doesn't realize it, uh, public dr drunkenness is also an issue. So behaving correctly can be compounded in a number of, of different ways, uh, but we can recognize what is the correct behavior. And this is what Bergson is trying to point out to us. We can laugh at others who have lost sight of that correct behavior, have lost sight of that vital creative force that allows us to adapt to a situation. So he writes in, uh, in his book, uh, Laughter in French's Le Rire, uh, he writes, where matter thus succeeds in dulling the outward life of the soul, 
in petrifying its movements and thwarting its gracefulness, it achieves at the expense of the body an affect that is comic. If then, at this point, we wished to define the comic by comparing it to its contrary, we should have to contrast it with gracefulness and even more, even more than with beauty. So beauty and gracefulness and style are things that we are capable of doing and we admire that in other people. We admire that in dancers, for example. Um, this is something that we recognize as potentially a good thing. But when we see individuals who are inelastic or, or stressed out or tense, um, it creates a source of laughter because we see the difference between what we are seeing and this person sort of uh, disconnected from their, their surroundings and what they should be doing, the way in which they should be behaving. So what's happening here is that laughter is coming into conflict. Uh, the mind is coming into conflict with the body. Now, if that mind is also clouded with alcohol, that could be either very funny or really kind of sad and pathetic. Uh, seeing someone do the speed wobbles down a sidewalk and wandering halfway into the street and back in again, that's bordering on terrifying because you know they're going to they're going to get hit by a car and it's there's nothing funny about it but if it's done again in that sliding scale that just keeps it on the cusp of a funny it can be but laughter is created when the mind comes into conflict with the body and when that body is doing something mechanical and repetitive something that the mind is saying well this is the way i've done it every other time and clearly that's not going to happen because of any number of circumstances in the environment that is stopping that from occurring. So if we are mechanical and repetitive, in other words, we've lost our élan vital, we're not in tune and we're not in tune with our environment. We're not realizing what's going on. So if we are able to laugh, we are able to stay in touch with that, what he calls a living ideal, right? The living ideal that is this vital force, that very thing that keeps us human, that identifies our humanness as a having or being of a particular kind and the opposite of inflexibility and repetition. So really what Bergson is going on about when he talks about this creative force that allows us to adapt and move according to what's going on, he says rigidity can be funny, uh, but it's also something that's unwanted. So we don't want to be rigid in our behavior. We want, we want to keep ourselves kind of loosey goosey and flexible. And when this is happening, laughter is what reminds us that we are in fact doing that very thing. As a matter of fact, if you think of, of a caricature, uh, think of, uh, you know, a, an artist sort of capturing the essence of a particular person. So when we are uh, doing a caricature, uh, we're looking and identifying that one specific characteristic, which is either physical or part of the personality. Um, and we're reducing that the entirety, the totality of that person to one thing. Now, nothing could be more rigid than thinking about a person reduced now to a, you know, a jutting jawline, uh, you know, a funny mustache, whether it's uh, Charlie Chaplin or Frank Zappa, it doesn't matter who it is. What's happening here is the caricature, right? That, that reduction of the, of the complexity and totality of a human being, that caricature is also at odds with our élan vital, right? With that vital creative force. And what happens is there is a degree of laughter that is uh, generated from that. Now, this, this next clip uh, runs about five or six minutes. It's a series of highlights from uh, movies by the French director Jacques Tati. And Jacques Tati worked primarily in the 50s. Uh, he might have made a movie in the late 40s, but certainly after the Second World War. Uh, but Jacques Tati is known as a physical comedian. And what makes his, his work really funny, uh, I, there's also a, a certain, well, the French would say, uh, a certain tristesse, a kind of, kind of wistful sadness about the disappearance of, of the original French landscape, whether it's rural or urban, uh, and being replaced by, you know, autoways and, and freeways and highways and urbanization and factories and, and all the things that are part of late capitalism right? Industrialization. But there, there's something wistful and I find quite beautiful in Jacques Tati's work where he's, he's making fun of it. He himself is that mechanical repetitive character doing the same thing over and over again and completely unaware of his surroundings. Uh, and so we're laughing. We're laughing at it because it is, it is funny. But if you stop and think about it, 
he's also gently reminding us of that which used to be there. And when we're laughing, we're going, okay, well, he's, he's acting in a certain way. He obviously was behaving differently in a different time, but that time better reflected the way he is now. And so he's, he's like a person out of time, right? He's a person sort of, and it should have, should live in a different space. So I don't want to get too philosophical about it. That's, that's for another day, but I want you to think about laughter created when the mind comes into conflict with the body and when the behavior is mechanical and repetitive, uh, pay attention, especially to the sound effects. Uh, Tati was a master of, of the right sound effect to, for, for comedic effect, uh, creaky door, uh, the young woman wa walking in her high heels. It sounds like the clip clop of a horse almost, uh, lots of funny, goofy things, but just odd, just general oddities. So again, it's not a full film. It's just highlights of clips from his movies, but there is this notion of Jacques Tati and some of the characters in his films acting in this very mechanical and repetitive way for, for the sake of comedy. So have a look at it and we'll see you in a moment. Okay, so we spoke uh, just a moment ago about uh, the, a caricature, right? Uh, that identifies some aspect of that person's personality. And if you identify it that way, you kind of make it predictable and rigid uh, so that Charlie Chaplin is nothing but, you know, just a little mustache right here, or even Adolf Hitler, who knows? But when we are doing this, we are reducing the complexity of human being down to one single image. And that's what a caricature is. So when we were doing that, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing it. Uh, I mean, an artist can do that very well. They can capture the essence of a person. But we need to keep in mind that when we do that, we reduce their elasticity. They re we reduce their ability to be something other than that caricature that we know them by. Um, so we want to make sure that we are not behaving ritualistically because ritualistic behavior is kind of empty behavior. Um, it's bordering, bordering on OCD sometimes, which is, again, I'm not in any way trying to condone that behavior or make it the source of laughter. This is an entirely different thing. But ritualistic behavior uh, could carry the potential for humor, but it depends on that, oh, on what kind. Is it something that can be changed? Is it something that it, that was a learned behavior that can be unlearned? Think back to what Ricky Gervais said in his interview, right? Things that people cannot help themselves doing. That's not the source of humor. So I want to be very clear on here when I say ritualistic behavior, things that people do all the time that, um, you know, whether it's throwing salt over a shoulder because of some superstition, doesn't do anything, but they do it anyway. Uh, that kind of predictable, uh, rigid behavior. That's kind of what we're, we're getting at here. So for Bergson, comedy begins when something mechanical is encrusted onto the living. Mechanical behavior, uh, is sort of uh, automism. And automism is simply not thinking, right? It's not thinking about what you're doing. So when we are acting unthinkingly, that's also right for comedy because we are nothing more than automatons. We're acting purely physically and not really engaging our, our minds with our bodies. And that can be the source of humor. So when the comical is associated with that kind of automatic or uh, automism, um, we can still laugh at it because it is something that can be unlearned, right? And that can be, uh, that can be changed in a person. Now, uh, John Morial in his book, Comedy, Tragedy and Religion, talks about something that I think really segues nicely into Bergson's notion of elastic elasticity and rigidity right? Losing one's sense of uh, the élan vital. And this notion of inflexibility and predictability, uh, in Morel's book, he talks about comedy and tragedy. And he says that they're based on different kinds of events, um, and sorry, not on events, but in fact, on characters in those events. So let's unpack this a little bit more, because it really kind of helps us to understand what Bergson is talking about. Bergson uh, would in fact say that a an individual who that is rigid, mechanical, acting like an automaton, uh, responding the same way no matter what is going on around them, ultimately is a tragic character. Uh, and so this is kind of what Morial is talking about. He says tragedy and comedy have different visions of, of life. They both explore and deal with the incongruities of life, the absurdities of life. But what makes them different 
is the way in which the heroes respond to them. So there is in tragedy, mental rigidity. You know, I've always done it this way. I'm going to do it this way again. You know, I'm the one who's right. So tragedy is mental rigidity versus comedy, which is mental flexibility. Think of Groundhog Day. Think of uh, all the all the rom-coms where, you know, again, a boy loses girl, boy, boy gets girl, or does whatever permutation it happens to be. There's always a lot of um, creative rethinking, you know, how that person can get that significant other back into their life. And of course, it always ends with either a baby or a marriage or something. But what, Il uh, what uh, sorry, Bergson is talking about in terms of that Elan Vital is more of a mental flexibility. And if we don't have that, we become tragic characters. So Morial in his book talks about the differences between, you know, simple versus complex, low versus high tolerance for disorder, uncritical versus critical thinking, emotional engagement versus emotional disengagement, stubbornness versus willingness to change, idealism versus pragmatism, um, or uh, pragmatism, I should say. As you can see on the left-hand side, simple, low, uncritical, emotional engagement, stubborn, ideal, that is someone who has lost their elan vital. They are no longer flexible. They are no longer uh, creative. They're no longer able to respond to their to the world around them. So they have lost their mental flexibility, and that's what makes them a tragic hero. Now think of the other side, on the right-hand side, where you have mental flexibility, uh, complex conceptual theme, uh, schemes uh, of experience, a high tolerance for a disorder, uh, critical thinking, emotional disengagement, stepping back and, you know, rising above it, uh, thinking outside the box, not sweating the small stuff, all those stupid cl cliches, a willingness to change. How's that for a nugget, right? Willingness to change. Well, if that didn't work, let's try something else, right? Who's got a plan B? And that's essentially the difference between a, a tragic hero who is stubborn, uncritical, simple versus a, a, a romantic comedy or just a, co a comedic hero that has all those things, especially critical thinking and a willingness to, willingness to change. If you have that, you have a much better chance of getting out of that predicament and, and you know, becoming a success and regaining that allant vital. Uh, this next clip is very short, but it kind of outlines you know, the di distinctions between a tragic hero uh, and not so much a, a comedic hero, but certainly a tragic hero, because we want to be able to point out what exactly uh, Morial directly and Brookson indirectly uh, talks about when they talk when they talk about mental rigidity. So have a look at this short clip, about two minutes long, on what is a tragic hero, and then we'll be back to the, the next bunch of slides. Okay, so superiority theory uh, is also has or also has to do with uh, our responses to the world around us, and we can be a tragic hero or a comic hero, and it just depends how we deal with these absurdities and incongruities, whether or not we can do it. So it's how we respond to those problems, because there are going to be problems no matter what. It's how we deal with them, and if we can be flexible. Uh, pragmatic individuals, you know, and we're social members. We're not going to light out for the territory. We're going to think on our own and we're going to fill ourselves with pride and only I know what to do. That's a tragic hero. Uh, so we want to be able to be sociable and we wish to be flexible, creative, keep that in vital in order to get out of problems that may be coming up. Now, there is also, just to, to finish up the last couple of slides here, uh, other ideas that are presented in the book. Um, in uh, Paul McDonald's book that I, I'm asking you to read, uh, another gentleman writing in the 1950s, Albert Rapp, uh, talks about something called thrashing laughter. Now, this one sort of aligns itself rather well with uh, Thomas Hobbes' notion of sudden glory, right? Uh, laughter, this, this triumphant cry, you know, aha, gotcha, that kind of thing. So he calls thrashing laughter th this ability to sort of, you know, um, have one over on somebody. And that other person being the source of, of humor because of their their behavior, their inflexibility, that deformity of human character, uh, of human, you know, behavior. But we're laughing and it's a triumphant cry because we recognize something in them that we don't do or certainly something we should not do. And so 
it's also healthy because it can diffuse tension. So it's a kind of thrashing laughter or a triumphant cry. Notice that almost military or, or fighting sort of metaphors. Uh, it is there, uh, but it is a certain type of laughter that we associate with watching people either take down someone else, like uh, a comedian dealing with a heckler is a really good example of sort of thrashing uh, laughter. Just through words, uh, the comedian, if they're good and if they can deal with hecklers, basically puts that person in their place and they do it and the, the audience is laughing because it's still comedic material. So that's what I think Rap is talking about when he, when he is discussing this kind of thrashing laughter. And we're laughing at things that, you know, that again, within the confines of comedy uh, has to do with human behavior. And uh, in this particular case, in this clip uh, from Live, uh, In Living Color, which was on in the early 90s, uh, they did a lot of what is now considered risque stuff. They pushed a lot of buttons. Uh, the show was very funny uh, at a particular time and place. And Homie the Clown, Homie the Clown was one of the characters, a recurring character that uh, didn't take any shit from people, essentially. And so we can laugh with him in this particular case at these sort of obnoxious bratty kids, but we're laughing primarily with Homie, right? He puts those kids in their place. So have a look at that one. It's about three minutes long, and then we're just going to come back and wrap up. So finally, uh, another book written uh, more recently, 1978, The Game of Humor. Uh, Charles Gruner uh, adds to this idea of, of thrashing laughter. Um, this notion of winning, right? Like a, a kind of combat. So whether you want to call them military metaphors or fighting metaphors, the idea of winning an argument, right? You know, winning at humor. Um, it, it used to be not so much around, but uh, around now, but uh, apparently, and I was never part of it, but in the 1950s, this was something that teenagers would do. I wasn't even born yet, uh, do, called doing the numbers. And doing the numbers would be basically sitting around three or four guys and they would they would try insulting one another but the game was that everybody was was ripe for 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 insult but you could turn around and say you know something else to your friend and it was doing the numbers it was trying to outdo the the previous person so this notion of winning winning it's not even an argument it's just winning the game right the game of humor and doing the numbers was exactly that. Bunch of guys all sitting around insulting each other and whoever came out with the best line that just basically topped everybody, that person would win the game, right? And that's all it really was. But uh, Gruner wants to point this out, this which is partly thrashing laughter, but it's again, this sort of uh, way in which you can set up a space that is clearly defined as comedic. It's not gonna, you know, people aren't gonna break out in a fight, at least they, they hopefully not. But this notion of winning, right, that extends or it is part of that superiority theory because that's kind of what's going on. People are trying to win this particular contest. Uh, finally, uh, Roger Scruton is, uh, it does talk about a superiority theory because he does point out something that is very important uh, that now brings us all the way back to Plato because he says, look, laughter devalues its object in the eyes of the one who laughs, which is why few enjoy being laughed at. Nobody be, likes being laughed at. So he says also, and, and it's again, he clearly is not embracing superiority theory, but neither is Plato or Bergson or Descartes or Hobbes. They identify it as a particular structure, right? A particular relationship that we have with the, the speaker or the writer of the joke and the and the subject of the joke. Um, now, if it's an animal rather than a human, you know, and that's the source of the joke, it's it's slightly different, but even there, there is a degree of superiority. But ultimately, it boils down to this: that no one likes to be laughed at. So the notion of laughter really devalues the 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 subject of the joke, and so scorn and mockery and derision uh, can make people laugh, and some people really thrive on that. But when you get to know them, you find out they've got some social problems as well. So it isn't just what they think is funny. So that quality of malice is there, right? It's something that we should avoid at, at all costs. Now, sarcasm, uh, it's, uh, Scruton believes is a kind of malevolent form of behavior. People can be sarcastic, they can be cutting. Um, and he says, you know, that's not the same as irony because irony can devalue the object, but it doesn't throw it away. 
when you are being ironic, you're also trying to instill the same kind of thing as what humor does, which is hold in our heads what is and what should be. Irony is, is undercutting what we're seeing, presenting it in such a way that we are realizing that, oh, this thing we're looking at, this situation, this person, this condition is inferior. And you could turn around and present it in such flowery terms that it's clear to the listener or the reader that you are making fun of it. But in the tone of your language, in the words that you've used to utter this idea, you've gone so far in the opposite direction that it is so disconnected from what you're seeing that you are now trying to instill a degree of sympathy or empathy or pathos in the listener. You want them to feel something. Sarcasm, there's no degree of, of, of feeling. It's simply being malicious and sarcastic. And sarcastic is, you know, it's just wordplay. And it can be very demeaning to, to another person. But when you are ironic, which is what Scruton is getting on about, uh, irony ultimately in the end tries to salvage that object, tries to save that object and, and present it to us in its opposite in the hope that we will realize that what we're seeing is deficient in some way. That situation, that person, that thing is deficient in some way in the way you've described it. There, there has to be a better way. And that's what he means. Okay, so we've run a little over an hour. Uh, lots of clips to, to watch. Hopefully most of them are funny or still funny. Um, but I want you to just consider all of the ideas that we've presented here because we started with sort of early forms last week of humor. Now we're going to sort of look at each one in more detail. This week we've looked at superiority theories um, and hopefully the clips kind of highlight these ideas. But generally, I want to be very clear that the thinkers that we discuss do not embrace superior theory. They, they, they don't reject it and say it doesn't exist. They clearly say that it does. They're just not, you know, they're not fans of it because it kind of looks, it looks at us as less than, you know, than good, less than reasonable, right? Appealing to our base instincts, uh, you know, mockery and sarcasm and these kinds of things demean other people. So we need to be very careful of it. And jokes can, you know, can work in that kind of a structure. So that's the essence of this, uh, of this set of, uh, slides. So, um, we'll see each other on Monday. I'm this time I'm going to post my clips. I'm sorry if I've got a little bit too much to watch, but they're, they're fun. Uh, and especially the, the Richard Gervais one, uh, ones, I should say the two of them, because now he really expresses out loud exactly what his, you know, his working model is. And it brings home all the ideas that we've discussed up to this point. So enough of my talking. I'm getting a little bit hoarse. Uh, we'll see each other on Monday. Have a good weekend because it is 12, 12 on a Saturday and I'm hoping to enjoy the rest of the weekend. So take care and we'll talk to you soon.